HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 373, recorded live Thursday, May 23rd, 2013. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik, offering the best in developer tools and support. Online at T-E-L-E-R-I-K.com. And by Franklins.net, makers of Gesture Pack, a powerful gesture recording and recognition system for Microsoft Connect for Windows developers. Details at GesturePAK.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Mark Rendell about making the change from desktop to web development. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I've got my buddy Mark Rendell on the phone from England. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Lovely, lovely. Um, you and I always have these kind of spirited discussions uh, slash arguments. I like to call them lower <laughs> lowercase a arguments. And uh, you uh, have been a desktop guy for, for a long time. I mean, what now, 20 years? Uh, yeah, and counting. And you do like C, and you did C and C++. I mean, you really made the desktop sing. Yeah. Um, I, I was doing Unix applications back in the, at the start of the 90s and then went through Windows 3.1 and Windows 95 and all those things um, with lots of different languages, uh, did some MFC work. Uh, did some VB work, used to use something called Gupta SQL Windows, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, dead now and probably for the best. Um, and then up through Windows Forms and then WPF and Silverlight. And so, yeah, hardcore desktop developer didn't really think that window, that web apps um, had uh, much to offer the world. Yeah. And web apps have, were, you know, were documents effectively for a very, very long time. And even yeah. until recently, it was just like you click and then the entire page refreshes. So you're basically kind of reading this book and going from page to page to page. And I always say that Gmail is when we kind of first noticed or maybe maybe Outlook Web Access was when things started to change. And you said, hey, this could be an app. Yeah. Um, but even I then, just, you were still not convinced. No, I just uh, – it was just the – fact that uh, you loaded an application on your desktop and it's loaded and then it's pulling data and and doing interesting things with it and generating graphs or uh, or exporting data and interacting with Office and all the other things you've got on your desktop. Mm -hmm. um, and I just didn't see how web applications could compete with that mm -hmm. until quite recently. Um, and uh, it's, it is the last couple of years. Um, well, I, I remember, just, I mean, you were in build 2011 still arguing against JavaScript itself. I was, although, uh, I mean, funnily enough, I went off, um, so they handed out the, the slates, uh, build, and I went off to my hotel that evening and wrote an application in, in C Sharp and XAML. But as I got more into, uh, working with, uh, building Windows 8 apps, I actually started writing the uh, the non-UI code in C Sharp um, and using the async await and all that good stuff. Uh, but I started doing the UIs in HTML mm -hmm. uh, just because I found it easier to work with, with CSS for doing the, the responsive screen and when you went snapped into different states and that sort of thing. Um, and, yeah, having been... Uh, quite a fan of XAML for quite a long time, I suddenly got into doing things with HTML and CSS, and I just thought, actually, for, for describing uh, a UI, this does appear to be better in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly um, a responsive one. I think that's the thing that, you know, XAML is, is just ridiculously powerful, almost to the point where the, well, not almost to the point, the, uh, the on-ramp to XAML is pretty steep. You know, to, to really be good. Yeah. But I think, I mean, the on-ramp to HTML is, is more shallow. Certainly both of them ratchet up, uh, pretty quickly, uh, in their, in their difficulty, but, uh, the, the initial on-ramp to, to XAML is pretty hardcore. It is. Uh, and particularly with the whole, um, MVVM and, uh, when you get into the needing to write your application in such a way that a designer can come along with blend. And work with just the, the XAML and not with the underlying code. And so you've got 
kind of mock data contexts or or whatever else is going on. Um, and when you get into theming and styling with XAML, that whole side of things, which is still in XAML, is really scary compared to CSS. Because there's uh, no CSS for XAML. No, there's there's just more XAML. Um, and it's just XAML piled on top of XAML, and you get to kind of resource dictionaries and resource dictionaries referencing other resource dictionaries. So we don't want to pile on, on XAML, but what I think is the interesting story here is your kind of personal transformation. And it's not about quitting one thing and jumping all in on the other, you know, that, although those kinds of stories are always interesting. Uh, this is more of a, you really just didn't think that the web was uh, nearly as useful as uh, as most people did. You were desktop and desktop till the end. Yeah, I, I honestly... Um a, a year, year and a half ago, I could not have seen myself becoming a a web developer, um, and that was partly just thinking it's not mature enough to build proper applications, and however far it catches up, desktop tools and WPF and XAML and all these things are going to stay two or three steps ahead of it. Um, but just the last. Uh, last year or so, and HTML5 is getting more and more support, and uh, IE9 had a lot of improvements, then IE10 came along, and IE10 Metro in, in the Windows 8 tablets. And I just started to think, um, you know, maybe you can actually do something useful here, and started investigating the tools. And once I started investigating the tools and the frameworks that were available, it was more okay, wow, this, there's some really cool stuff here. You can actually do really great things with this. Does this, does this make you think the desktop is dead? Because like I say, people always go you know, back and forth with these things. They'll, they'll declare that, oh, well, this is clearly, you know, the, the desktop is going to die, now the web is all there is. But then something on the, on, the, on the desktop will happen that's so amazing that no one can believe it, you know, and then we'll, we'll bring the metronome back. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I... Um, I uh, am currently uh, waiting until I have enough money in the bank to buy a new full tower desktop computer just because I want something with a uh, NVIDIA graphics card and all that sort of stuff um, and there are things that uh, I still think for a, a long time are going to be the domain of the desktop uh, if for no other reason than uh, data transfer and bandwidth for a lot of people mm -hmm. isn't at the point yet where you can kind of just quickly load up a one gigabyte uh, raw image file that you've taken with your 50 megapixel camera mm -hmm. um, and load that into the browser uh, and start uh, working with it. So, you know, Adobe Creative Cloud, it might be called Creative Cloud, but it's still a bunch of desktop applications. And I can't see Photoshop becoming a, a browser-based application for a while. Um, but I can see, uh, within the next five to 10 years, Visual Studio becoming a, a browser based application. Um, mm. ob and obviously, Word and Excel and PowerPoint already have browser based applications, and they do most of the things that uh, the desktop versions do. Um, yeah, it's not, it's, a, it's not an unreasonable kind of leap of logic if you think about it. Uh, I mean, out, the Outlook web application is really amazing, you know, especially, especially the new one. If you've used the Office 365, yes, yeah, I, mean, I, have I, Office. I hate to say it, but I, I sometimes find myself using the uh, the web version of Outlook just because it's lighter weight than the desktop one. Yeah, it's just, uh, just a little faster. It is, and and it gets you there quicker. And um, I just find myself more and more these days where I look down at my taskbar and the only things open are the browsers. Mm. Um, and kind of wishing, actually, that some of the things that are down there were in the browser. Mm -hmm. um, Although still we don't want a Chromebook, though. Isn't that funny? Like, like you're, we all say, isn't it wonderful that we only run the browser and then one or two apps? And then when we are given a computer that runs only the browser, we're like, yeah, not so much. Yeah, um, I, it's nice to know that on those times when when my uh, cable company manages to completely disconnect broadband for an evening, I can still do most things on my computer. Can't play SimCity, obviously, but I can do most things. 
Um, so yeah, you know, uh, but it's it's increasing. It's it's kind of switched the other way. So where I used to think there's the desktop application and then the web version is the lightweight alternative. Um, now I'm thinking there's the web application and the desktop is the heavyweight alternative when there's something that I can't do in the browser app for whatever reason that might be. Um, and uh, I mean, Spotify is a great example. Um, I've got a Windows 8 machine and there are issues with the Spotify desktop application on Windows 8, uh, depending on what drivers you've got and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have that running in a Chrome tab and it's fine. And it's, it does everything that the, uh, the desktop application does. And Spotify doesn't work offline anyway. So, um, you know, even if you've got the desktop application, it's still not caching things locally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's just more and more and more. And you look at some of the things that some people are doing. So, I mean, uh, the browser-based Office 365 application is one example. Uh, I don't know if you've played much with Cloud9 IDE. Yeah, you do I, a lot I of have. Node work. Yeah, it's, it's, it, that's the thing that makes you believe that maybe you could, in fact, uh, do Visual Studio on the cloud. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I would probably be thinking about trying to do a a C-sharp.net IDE uh, in the browser um, if it wasn't for the fact that Microsoft are currently pushing things on a visualstudio.com domain, which makes me think, hmm, maybe that's <laughs> going to happen anyway and I don't want to waste too much time on it. Well, like the new, yeah, the new TFS stuff all runs at visualstudio.com and you can have like your own domain, you can have your own subdomains, like I have hanselman.visualstudio.com. Yeah, I mean, I've got my stuff in there. Um, I'm using the Git service in it rather than the uh, the TFS service but um, I'm pretty much the only person who works on my code and Git's got a much nicer workflow for a single user uh, than TFS No, I think um, when I say TFS I'm not talking about the source control. TFS, the issue tracking and all that stuff. I use Git yeah, too Yeah, um, sorry so but no, I was going to say the, uh, the browser based TFS, um, for various reasons, I use TFS in Firefox because I use it with a different live ID than I use in my other browsers. Mm-hmm. Um, but the browser-based tools for the the task board, the Kanban board, uh, and just the general overview are way better because you get like an entire browser window instead of that little Team Explorer sidebar, which is trying to cram all that information in. Um, and you know, editing story cards and moving things across and all this sort of stuff is in the browser. You've got this lovely GUI story, uh, whereas in Visual Studio, it doesn't seem to be quite the same. The thing that I find the most frustrating when I'm doing work on um, on the web is I just I still don't feel like the um, like the debugging story is quite there. You know, I, I find myself in Visual Studio and I'm doing stuff and then I run over into Chrome or into IE and I hit F12 and I struggle to really understand what the heck's going on in JavaScript. Like, I feel like there's an opportunity to kind of disrupt things with a much better experience for explaining what exactly is going on right now, you know? I think so. Uh, I think I think some of that's down to JavaScript as a language and the fact that it's it's dynamic and so there's a limit to how much information you can have while you're uh, debugging through it in the browser. Um, the thing that really annoys me with the debugging experience is that there are uh, things that each of the three browsers I use does really well. Right. Um, and I just think, why can't uh, why can't Chrome do um, IE's uh, Quick watch and the sort of the stuff that's built in for inspecting variables. I don't like the way Chrome does the variable inspection. Mm-hmm. I use it's more like Visual Studios, so that works for me. But at the same time, why isn't I use F12 developer tools extensible? Right. Um, and then over in Firefox, uh, it's really it's not Firefox; it's Firebug, and right. you install that, and there's some really great stuff in there, but they're not. It's not deeply integrated into the browser, um, and also it's having to update itself every however often it is. 
Um, but have you had a chance to play with uh, source map debugging in Chrome uh, with TypeScript? Uh, yeah, in fact, I have, uh, because uh, if you've played with uh, VS Web Essentials, Mads Christensen's playground for our ASP.NET yeah. labs, uh, he'll make source maps for you uh, with anything. So you can actually right-click in uh, the Solution Explorer and minim- minify stuff. And then, of course, with TypeScript, you can just dash dash source maps, and it'll spit source maps out when you do your uh, your compilation at the command line. I, I actually end up putting that in my CS proj so that that stuff happens on build. Yes, I have a, I have a pre-build step uh, that does a tsc.exe mm-hmm. across all my TypeScript files. But it's it's one of the things with um, the IE team and their uh, longer release cadence than, than Chrome and Firefox is you don't get these advances coming in. Um, and because the F12 developer tools aren't extensible. Meaning that, um, that, that IE does not have source map control support yet. No, so there are basically for when you're working with TypeScript, uh, you've got two options. One is to debug in Visual Studio, which it works, but it doesn't feel particularly natural. Right, but let's let's back um, up a moment and just give people okay. an understanding about what source maps are and why we should care about them. Okay, so source maps uh, are like a PDB file for JavaScript that you've either. Uh, generated by compiling another language uh, like TypeScript or CopyScript or Clojure um, or when you have passed your JavaScript through a minifier and turned it into a single unreadable line of randomness uh, and a source map will link bits of either that JavaScript or that minified file back to the line of source code that it originally came from Uh, and if you're using Chrome uh, debugger tools or uh, for TypeScript if you're working in Visual Studio 2012 with the TypeScript plugin um, you can uh, you still have to set the breakpoint in the JavaScript uh, but when it breaks it goes to the TypeScript file that that JavaScript was compiled from and then you can step debug through the TypeScript. So you hit F10 and it goes to the next line of TypeScript and you can view the TypeScript variables and, and all that sort of thing. Uh, which, um, obviously, you know, a couple of years ago, you were talking about JavaScript as the assembly language for the web. Mm-hmm. And, but one of the big issues with it was the particular, you know, CoffeeScript's been big for a couple of years. But when people were trying to work out why their CoffeeScript wasn't working, they were having to step debug through the JavaScript and then try and work out how to fix that in the CoffeeScript. Uh, or if you were me, instinctively fixing it in the JavaScript and then overwriting that the next time you did a build. Um, so now you have source maps and you can actually, uh, you can break that divide in the same way that, you know, as, as desktop native programmers or C-sharp programmers, uh, you don't have to step debug through the bytecode. You can link it back to the, the C-sharp that it came from and inspect things there. Right, right. Because web applications have a, a, you know, or reasonably sized ones have this idea of a release, a release mode. And the configuration of the application that you work on in release mode is different from the debug mode one. Yeah. You know, for a small app, you could absolutely go and throw out uh, your application exactly as you work on it. But uh, when you put it into production, you minify things, you compress things, you change settings, you include all sorts of things in source maps for that bridge. And that's a, a killer feature. Like, you have to have that. And if you're going to start yeah. using something like TypeScript or CoffeeScript and you want to debug back to the original, it's so important to have. And if, if IE's developer tools were written in JavaScript, presumably we would be able to, uh, to extend them. Uh, yes. Um, I, I don't know what... Uh what Google's, what Chrome's developer tools are, are written in, but uh, one of my long-time bugbears with IE is that it's not particularly extensible, uh, which is, is a shame. But what have you built? What is this, is this is not holding you back, apparently. Like, What have you built that is comparable to a desktop application now that has got you so, so stoked about the web? So I've spent the last uh, a year and a half, nearly, building uh, Zudio which is a storage, Azure storage management tool um, that's done entirely in the browser, in HTML5 and 
uh, at runtime it's JavaScript, but when I'm building it, it's it's a few thousand lines of TypeScript split across 40-odd files. Um, and it's very strange. I have, uh, I have my um, web application, which has got controllers folder and, and all the sort of server-side stuff. And then there's also an app folder, which has got all my TypeScript inside it. And inside there, I've got the same thing for the client side. So I've got a controllers and a services folder and, and all these uh, mm-hmm. TypeScript files are spread, spread across all these things. Mm-hmm. And then I have a build process that combines them all together and mm-hmm. uh, minifies them and everything. Um, and yeah, it's uh, the the fact that the only tool that the only tools that were available for managing as your storage were desktop applications was frustrating me um, at first because I wanted to be able to use my iPad uh, and then various other tablets and phones uh, and things. Um, and then because you have licensing that says you can only use this on two machines, um, otherwise you have to buy another license. And you just, I, I've got, I have a lot of computers that I have access to. Um, and so, yeah, I thought, let's see if I can build that as a web app. I originally thought I'm going to do an iPad application for working with Azure Storage, but then I thought, well, that's all very well, but Android and uh, and other things, and then Windows 8 uh, tablet coming along. Um, so I thought I'd try and do it as a web app. Uh, started the first time through using uh, a third-party kind of controls library for JavaScript, um, and jQuery and uh, Knockout for binding and so forth and got one third of the application written and I was reasonably happy with it but the code was a mess um, and this was before TypeScript came along and uh, when you're writing JavaScript unless you are very experienced and you've developed some good practices over the years mm-hmm. uh, you tend to end up with your JavaScript all over the place and some of it's in script tags and some of it's in that file over there and because there is no formal build process um, I could never really find a way of uh, of getting my JavaScript organized. I see, so phrased, phrased differently as I've said before the idea that compilation is the first unit test. I was talking last week with uh, Brian from LucidChart, and he was telling me that they use Clojure and write a whole bunch of JavaScript. LucidChart is their kind of Visio for the web application. Mm-hmm. And it is, you know, many, many thousands of lines of JavaScript. And he says that having this compilation step or having, more specifically, having type checking catches an entire class of errors that you just wouldn't catch otherwise. Like even the best JavaScript person might not might have these errors just latent sitting there unless they have a lot of unit test coverage to catch them. Yeah, and uh, and you can write unit tests that will catch these things, um, but uh, you are writing unit tests just to catch type errors. Uh, mm. And so if you can if you can have a compiler that runs and you can say to that compiler, okay, so any object that gets passed to this function has to have these three properties and could potentially have these other two, uh, like you can with TypeScript interfaces, Um, then rather than you having to go, well, what are the possible things that could happen and what could go wrong here and everything else, you can just go F6 and uh, the compiler will just go, you idiot, you've left off the count property on on this thing that you're trying to pass to a web service, which is blatantly not going to Mm -hmm. work. Uh, Do it again and then hit F6 again. But why now? Why isn't that different from um, just using like JS Lint? Because JS Lint doesn't know uh, it doesn't know about types. It it, it will pick up uh, things like missing semicolons, and you can get it to pick up. Uh, I, I use I prefer JS Hint to JS Lint because um, JS Hint doesn't tell me uh, that I haven't laid out my code right, um, but yeah, JS hint will say uh, if you use double equals there, and you probably meant to use a triple equals and uh, and things like that. But it can't tell if you've got a chain of functions um, what the shape of the objects that are being passed between those functions should be. Uh, so it can't pick up type errors 
because it's working with a dynamic language. Um, and what TypeScript does is it says for all of these functions, I can basically just annotate the parameters and say this needs to be this interface or this is a string. Uh, and then if I try and call a function that's expecting a string and try and pass a bean in there, mm -hmm. then it'll tell me about it. Um, and uh, I've had people who question the usefulness of this, and I just try and point them to the number of times every day I hit F6 and have errors, type errors in my TypeScript. Um, so, you know, maybe it's just because I suck. Mm -hmm. that, um, <laughs> it, might, I, might I, be, it might be why. Yeah, you know, I, I need to have my hand held by the compiler and stop me from making stupid mistakes. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it's it's uh, possibly a luxury tool. It's possibly just uh, a nice thing to have, but it makes me more productive. Um, it makes me less likely to release code uh, into the wild that is going to, say, object not defined or um, property not found. Uh, and particularly since my target market is largely web developers, these are the guys who, if there's an error in the JavaScript, it's not going to show a little yellow triangle down in It's going to throw up a huge Greg dialogue box saying, debug this, mm. and they're going to go, yes! So, yeah, having TypeScript in there is... Uh, I think it's it's really accelerated my uh, my journey to the dark side or light side, depending on your point of view. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you think that this is something that's going to become more mainstream? I mean, like there are those that find TypeScript or CoffeeScript or Clojure or whatever, and they say, this is it, I found it, this is what I need to be doing. And then there are others who just say, no, no, always get back. To the, there's almost a get back to the metal kind of renaissance right now around JavaScript. Yes. Like, like we're all learning Assembler, right? Yeah. We're all learning Assembler, and now it's time to, uh, you know, move to C. And the, the, the assembler folks are like, yeah, I don't really know. I kind of like assembler. It's important to know assembler. Yeah. Um, I like the, the C++ guys arguing with the C guys and the C guys going, ah, you objects and your precompiler stuff and, and all this nonsense. You just, you just need structs and functions and get on with it. Um, so I, uh, I think some of the, Evolutions in the JavaScript language that they're currently talking about with ECMAScript 6 are good, and TypeScript actually just gives you a lot of those now um, in a way that uh, compiles to JavaScript until JavaScript catches up, and then it'll just go, oh, I'll just leave that there. Um, I think the backlash is more against... Uh, I was talking to someone earlier about this today. Um, it's more against the libraries, and particularly, uh, I think jQuery is getting a hard time at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, uh, you kind of you just drag jQuery on to your uh, your HTML files or your CSS HTML files without even thinking about it, mm. and you just use dollar paren uh, hash something or dot something um, because it's just there, and you it, you forget that it's not part of the language. Um, I actually had a guy uh, report a, an issue with Zudio where the landing page came up, um, mm -hmm. which it, and it loads the landing page very quickly, does the layout very quickly. And uh, he was clicking the login button, and it wasn't working for like four seconds because it was downloading jQuery so that jQuery could say dollar, uh, dot login button, dot on click, or, or whatever it was. And it's just, I hadn't thought about it. And so... Uh, that was the only thing. I was downloading uh, a 50k file into people's browsers mm. so that I could add a click event handler to uh, a button. And it's kind of... I don't think I really need to do that. Um, I can I can rewrite that with uh, query element all and just add a click handler with the add event listener. And so, yeah, I think I had to write three extra lines of code over what was already there. Right. Um and eliminated kind of a 50k download for people. But you had to and, think. But yeah, I just hadn't thought about it. And I think that's the that's the backlash, is people including jQuery so they don't have to think 
rather than including jQuery for what jQuery was originally intended for, which was to cover the uh, the disparities between different browsers' implementations of the DOM and, and the uh, the JavaScript models and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and even jQuery 2.0, I think they've knocked uh, 19k off the file size by dropping support for the older browsers. Right. Um, but it's still big, and it's still you know, do you really need it? Uh, so, um, I think that's that's the backlash. Uh, I think um, there are the newer, the big kind of MVW uh, frameworks like AngularJS, which is what I'm using, uh, Backbone and Ember and so forth, those and Knockout and Breeze. Those are actually bringing a level of convenience and, and helpfulness and helping you do stuff that would take a very long time to do in vanilla JavaScript. Um, and so I don't think anyone's saying, stop using them. Uh, for building these big applications. I think it's just stop using jQuery for everything. Uh, stop putting the dollar there all the time. Um, not stop using jQuery altogether, but just think about it. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, you, if you've got one jQuery call in your entire application, maybe you should rewrite it just using JavaScript. I definitely think there's a maturity that is coming soon. I think that we are all writing Assembler and we are used to using different libraries. So we're going to kind of thrash for a little bit as we try to figure out what exactly this thing that we're building wants to become and then uh, go to whatever the next step is. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably right. Um, but, I mean, all I know is that I spent the last uh, six months um, having got to the kind of point where uh, I had unmanageable, unmaintainable code in JavaScript and various other things. I basically threw most of the code away rewrote the whole of Studio from scratch in uh, TypeScript and AngularJS uh, and using Twitter's bootstrap uh, components. Mm-hmm. And I have not had this much fun coding uh, for a very long time. I think since I first found C Sharp. Uh, so when I went from what I was on to C Sharp, it's got this is the best language ever. <laughs> um and I don't have to delete my objects and, and all this sort of thing. And yeah, working with, with TypeScript, with HTML and CSS and the bootstrap, uh, components and with Angular JS, which is, uh, I, th- I think it's the holy grail of data binding. Um, it just, it is so good at working out that you change something 15 levels down in an object hierarchy and just reflecting that in the browser screen um and yeah it's just awesome and i'm having a really great time uh and having fun just churning this code out um and building something that uh is is in the browser and doing things that i didn't think browsers could do a couple of years ago so yeah so where can people see your application in uh, kind of in closing? Where can they go and see this, uh, what you're working on in uh, the real world? You can go to zud.io because uh, when you're doing a, a cloud tool like this, you have to have a .io domain. <laughs> um, you can sign up for a free trial now. If you're using Azure storage, blobs, tables, or queues, then uh, just sign in with your Windows Live ID. It'll start you a 30-day free trial. Um, and then when that runs out, uh, I'm going to... Uh, give you uh, a discount code for handsome Linux listeners. Uh, so they're just going to be able to go along and put HM20 in, which will give them uh, 20% off a, a one-year subscription after their free trial. That's very kind. Cool. Uh, Thanks for doing that. Well, you know, uh, I suspect that this is going to be a good way to get people who will tell me what's wrong with it. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but it's... I've been using it. Um, I haven't used... I've been dog fooding it all the way through building it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's what I use now uh, every day. Um, and I think it's... it's. I'm really proud of it. Uh, I think it's a good example of what you can do with uh, just one guy and six months uh, as a web application. Um, and I've got a lot of plans to expand on it with new features and, and other things. So, cool. uh, yeah, I hope people... another episode of Handsome Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.